Hi everyone, I'm Aurore Betranzi. I'm a PhD student working in Stockholm University. And I'm working on Cocolab supernova simulations, which is why today I will try to present you a good recipe on how to explode stars, because it's basically the theme of my PhD. So um, it's a recipe. So we'll, we will need a list of ingredients. So for exploding a star, we of course need a star. We also need some neutrinos. So those particles that barely interact with anything, but they're here really important. And you will also need to learn how to steer correctly your preparation. It should result in a nice warm neutron star. And the time of preparation is a bit less than a second, actually. So I will first present you with a video of what is going on. And then we will see. So here on the video, you see in yellow is the matter growing, in blue is a shock, and in dark blue in the middle is the neutron star. So what you are seeing right now is a shock stalling, and this is this shock at the end that will go through the old star and make it explode. You see that the shock is nicely moving around right now, and it's a steering I will talk about later on. So this is a simulation that was made uh, in the US by Sun Couch. It's a 3D simulation. We don't have so many of them, even less nice movie of them, which is why you don't see here the final explosion. So first step in your recipe, you will need to find the right type of stars. If you take a star that is too small, it will not work. Too big, it will not work either. So you will need a, mass, a star that has a mass between approximately eight or seven solar masses, and not much more than 40 solar masses. So solar mass is the mass of the sun. This is obviously the star the closest to us, which is why we focus typically on this one when we want to parameterize some things. So if you want numbers, it's approximately two to the power 30 kilograms, which don't represent anything for you. So yeah, the thing is that I told you, if you choose a star too small, you will have a bit of a problem because you will not manage to get an explosion. For example, our, star, uh, our sun will never explode into a supernova. It will just finish its life and more or less extinguish into a white dwarf. White dwarf can explode, but way later, and it's an all other process. It's not as straightforward. And if you take a star that is way too big, you will have too much dense, either too much density and fall directly into a black hole. You will not have any kind of explosion either. Or you will have an explosion that you cannot control and it will just end up disrupting the old star. So you will not have a neutron star at the end or a white dwarf. You will just have a cloud of gas staying there. Not really interesting either. So you don't want that. Once you have your star, you need to be sure that it's at the right side of its life. So if you take a star that is too young, it will not be able to explode. And so you need to wait until the fusion in the core of your star has managed to produce enough iron. So the fusion goes from burning hydrogen into helium, helium carbon, and you go on like that, until iron. Iron is the most stable element, so this is when the fusion will stop. So you want to have a nice iron core, more or less, two solar masses, two, three solar masses, something along that line. So how do you, how can you know when your star is good? So here on the right, you can see what we call the ashburn russell diagram. It's temperature and luminosity diagram. So you need the star to be in the late stages of its life. Here in the middle, you can see the, what we call the main sequence. So it's when the star is burning hydrogen and helium and it's simply living its life. This is where our sun is. You can see it there. White dwarfs, of course, you don't want those one. So you want this part, which is when the star is at the latest point of its life. So by looking at what is the star temperature and how luminous it is, you can find out when your star is good. So now, in the third step, once you have a star that is at the latest stage of its life, it has a nice iron core, you need to stop the radiations in the core. As you cannot fusion iron, then the, the emission of radiation will stop. 
But how does a star stay itself usually? Because, I mean, it's a massive object, so it wants to collapse. So the radiations are usually protecting the star from collapsing on itself. So if you stop the radiations, it will begin to collapse. So now, this part, you don't have anything to do. You just wait and observe. And you observe and wait for the bounce. So at some point, the core, the, while the star contracts, the core will get so dense that it will not be able to contract more, which, which is what we call the proton neutron star in the middle. So it's not exactly still a neutron star. It's a neutron star in preparation, but it cannot collapse more. So but there is still matter falling on it, right? So it will literally bounce. The matter falling on it will rebound and go out. And the information about this matter going out will go through the matter, creating a shock that would, at the end, disrupt the entire star. Now, the problem is, as you saw in the first video, at some point, the shock stops. It just stops because there is still farther matter, matter falling through. So it has a hard time going against. It's like trying to go against the flow in a river. It's hard. At some point, it will just stop. So you need to re-energize it if you want to have an explosion. So for that, you will need two things, neutrinos and a good mixing. So first, you need to incorporate the neutrinos into, uh, from your proton neutron star into the shock. So the neutrinos, even if usually they barely interact with anything, they don't even interact with the Earth. They literally go through Earth. Not saying much. Uh, quite often. And there is a lot of neutrinos passing through you right now without you realizing it. But the thing is that when you are in the core of a star that is very, very dense, not only you have a lot of matter, but you also have a lot of matter that is at extremely high temperature, then the neutrinos will have more tendencies to interact with the matter. Which is why when your proton neutron star is cooling and emitting neutrinos in the process, they can go to the shock and give some more energy to the shock, which is very good. And you also need to, sorry, video will come. You also need to steer it correctly. It's like when you're doing, I don't know, crepes, for example, when you add the floor, you want to steer slowly but correctly if you don't want to have weird stuff going around. So this is what you want to do. And the steering is what we call either the neutrino drive and conviction, so neutrino warms the matter and it begins to do like in a pan, like bubbles going around. Or you have the, what we call SASI for standing accretion shock instability. So, well, your shock is there, you know, but at some point you will begin to move on itself and this will finally help the explosion. So now I have a short video from a simulation um, that will show you approximately how SASI looks. So you can see in 3D in the middle, the star going. So now the shock begins to stall. And you can see on the side, the 2D representations of what you would see. And you can see this sloshing motion going in. And this is what we call the sassy. So this stands, I mean, we say it stands in a long time because it stays for a few hundred milliseconds. Um, so, of course, it doesn't seem like a long time, but if you consider that the entire explosion is happening in less than a second, then you understand how SASI can be very important in the whole process, and quite long, actually. So, yeah, here we basically see your shock nicely moving around, and this is also moving the matter, make it, making it more dense at some places, so it will let the neutrinos have more time to interact with said matter and giving it more energy in order for the shock to finally develop and explode the star. So here you see that we begin to explode. You have a dipolar explosion, like most of the time, and then it turns again into another form of dipolar explosion. And it gets out of the box. So this is when we stop. Um, so yeah, as I said before, you sprinkle the neutrino via the neutron star. And with the searing, you should be able to revive your shock in the end. So now your explosion is going on. And it's super nice. But thing is, how do you know if your explosion worked in a nice way? It's like, you know, when you bake bread, 
you want to know if you have a good bread at the end or not. So the same thing you will do with food. You can look at supernova in three different ways. Uh, you can look at it literally. So the electro electromagnetic radiations, so the photon you receive from uh, the supernova. Problem is, our photons are trapped in the beginning and during the process. This whole process is really short. And as we said, there is still matter in falling into the star. So the photons cannot get through this matter, which is why we have a very hard time of observing the very, very first stage of the supernova that I just described to you. For that, we need the other, um, other messengers. So if here I said smell it for the neutrino emission. As I said, neutrinos are ejected a lot from the proton and transar. They will not all get into the matter in the shock. Some will also directly escape. And those neutrinos that escape, if we manage to see them, will give us extremely important informations on what is happening during the collapse, like the size of the proton neutron star, how fast it's cooling, its mass, and a lot of things like that. And you can also, well, almost literally feel the texture. Uh, so it's the gravitational waves that will give you this information. I think a lot of you already heard of gravitational waves because they are a pretty hot topic in the last years since they discovered in 2015. Gravitational waves are basically ripple into the structure of the universe. So if you're imagining, for example, a stone falling into water, you will see the ripple, which is a propagation of this information going out. The same is happening here, basically. But the water is our universe and everything around you. Of course, we as humans cannot feel them because they are extraordinarily tiny. I will tell you just after how we managed to see them. But as well, gravitational waves are happening in the very beginning of the collapse. And if we can manage to see them, to feel them, we will have extremely important transformations. So how should your supernova look? You can look at it in two different ways, either the magnitude in some different colors. Here it's a red band, so 400 nanometers. And as you can see, here in the beginning, we are rising after we are lowering. Thing is, if you look precisely at the time scale, we are on days and hundreds of days, so almost years, which is not exactly the one second we were talking about, right? It's because the photons you receive from a supernova are not directly coming from the old process that happened, as I explained to you. They only come once the explosion has already happened. So your explosion is happening, and there is a lot of radioactive material produced, which is at nickel-56. It will then go down into cesium-56, and this will emit a lot of photons and light. And this is what you see. This is why you can see a peak here. It's because this is when your nickel is emitting the most. And after, I mean, Cesium-56, it doesn't even match, or anything, basically. Um, so, of course, it will decrease. And this, the size of this peak and the duration of the peak will depend on the amount of nickel-56 that you produce, which still can give us hints on how exactly the explosion is happening, but not on the first second. It can give us hints on what was the external structure of the star or how was the stuff around. For example, if you have a star in a binary, you will not see the same thing as if you have a single star traveling around. So this is one of the things you can look at. And the other is to take um, spectra, as simple as that. So here the spectra is an extreme, and you can see different peaks that each correspond to a different element. This will allow you to see which kind of elements you produce in a supernova. This is really interesting because supernova are one of the main places for nucleosynthesis, so for the creation and the dispersion of the elements that know we can see. When universe began, you had hydrogen, helium. So we're still lacking quite a lot of elements. And so in the very beginning, the massive stars were exploding in supernova. This is how we ended up with being able of having a Earth, all those kind of things. And because we have heavier elements than helium or, than helium or hydrogen. 
So this is also why supernova is extremely important to study and so important into the cosmological story in itself. Now, the neutrino detection. As I said, neutrinos don't like to interact, which is quite problematic when you want to look at them and to receive them and to study them. Fortunately, uh, some people have spent decades and decades on trying to do it, and now we can do it quite nicely. Problem is, we need a lot of them to be able to see only a few, of only a few percent of those. So this is why I say the smell is usually very faint and you need to be close, because in order to detect neutrinos from a supernova, we need it to happen in our galaxy. Problem, supernovas in our galaxy happen every 50 years or 100 years. And this led to another problem. The last one was in 87, 1987. So, and all detectors were not as good as they are now. So now we are literally just waiting for galactic supernova to happen, which is a bit annoying sometimes, I must say. So here I showed you nice pictures of those detectors. So you have ice cube, in the Arctic or Antarctic, I never remember which one, but Ice Cube is, well, exactly what it's named after, a gigantic uh, cube of ice, so they literally used uh, glass here, and they put it photoreceptors into this glass here. Then when the neutrino interact with um, frozen water, it, they will deliver some photons, those photons will be captured by the photoreceptors, and we will have some information. No, Hypercamio Candy uh, is the second one you can see. Every single yellow spot you see is an enormous photoreceptor. It's a one meter photoreceptor. So this is extremely high technology. Usually this thing is full with water. And from what we heard from one of the researchers there, please don't fall in or don't try to swim in uh, because this water can disintegrate you. Uh, so don't go <laughs> there for a swim. I mean, not that you would probably want, but please don't. Um, Hypercamia Candace and Ice Cube are the main ones right now that are functioning well. And we have a new detector in Kome and also that is called Dune. So the Dune experiment is literally under Earth. I mean, Hypercamia is also under Earth because you don't want random radiations to come through. Um, and also full with photoreceptors, and it will be full with water as well. So those are three ways for now of detecting neutrinos. There is a few other receptors, but they are not focused on that. Now the textures, gravitational waves. I think that most of you heard about Virgo and LIGO. So LIGO is um, com uh, composed of two bases like that, two interferometers, um, one in the western part of the US and one in the eastern part of the US, and Virgo is in Italy. So 40 kilometers long, four kilometers long, not 40, sorry, four kilometers long arms uh, with an extremely powerful laser going through in order to do some kind of photometry, of uh, interferometry. interferometry. Hmm. We'll never be able to pronounce it right. Um, so here you have some gravitational wave simulations from Abdi Kamalov at all. So it's, it came up this year. And this is what you would see if a 13 solar mass, 19, 25, or 60 solar masses supernova was going. So this is the gravitational waves you would see. Unfortunately, as you can see on the right, once LIGO will be advanced, we will see we will see a bit more things, but we barely see anything uh, because those gravitational waves are so faint. And once with the Einstein telescope will be a bit more developed, we will be finally able to access these informations. But for now, same problem as with the nationals, if we don't have a galactic supernovae, we don't see anything. So this is why it's it's long science because we have to make a theory about something we cannot directly see. And we just hope that our codes are working. What can be a good verification of our codes and to see if they are working is to compare them with each other. So this is what we usually do. And to as simple as obtaining a good and classical explosion in 3D 
is not as straightforward as it seems and was actually only done three years ago for the first time to have a robust explosion in 3D. So it's still a work in progress. Is there No, we have a lot of really reliable codes and we can probe deeper and deeper um, the physics in supernova. And few variation of the recipe of exploding stars. So if you take a star that is a bit too small, around seven solar masses, something along that line, you will, you will obtain an electron capture supernova, which is another type of supernova. So the core begins to collapse, but then you have electron captures, so you emit a lot of radiations. And it will be a mix between thermonuclear supernovae and core collapse supernovae with a lot more ejecta. So it will look quite differently, actually. And it's fairly easier to explode, trust me. If your star is way too big, uh, you will have, as I said before, nothing. But if star is just a bit too big, this kind of electron capture will also happen while the star is collapsing and at the end of its life. So you will see a star that is basically pulsating. You will have all bursts of light before the end of its life. And this is due to also electron capture or, or what also we call pair instability. So you will have something that is flashing, 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 and finally exploding. It's quite cool to look at. Better just mal my end up that way. We don't know yet. And it might be in thousands of years, so... But hopefully it would end up that way. And the problem is that in the recipe is quite easy to fail. As I told you, it's hard to obtain explosions in 3D. And why is it so easy to fail? Well, because if you don't steer right, if you don't have a right sassy or a nice convection, or if you don't have enough neutrinos, or they are not interacting enough with the matter, your shock will not be able to go forward at all anymore, but it will not only stall, it will recede. And all the matter will come onto the proton neutron star. Unfortunately, as far as we know, proton neutron star can hardly be more massive than two solar masses because the force that is helping them staying like they are, basically, uh, is overcome after a while. So if all the matter is falling back into your proton neutron star, you will just end up with a solar mass black hole. When I say solar mass, it's not one solar mass. It's just because there are several different types of black holes. You will hear that just later from the second speaker. But stellar mass black hole, they are tiny, basically. Just tiny black holes. They were probably the first ones created, and they are tiny. So, yeah. That's mainly it, actually. Uh, that's, I hope I didn't lose anyone in the process. And no, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. You can ask more technical questions. Um, working in supernova theory, so I have no problems. I should have no problems answering most of the questions. If you want more details or if there is something that wasn't clear, don't hesitate at all. And thank you for listening. What is the brightest type of supernova? Uh, we call them hypernovae. So the brightest type of supernovae is what we call hypernovae, because we are really inventive as people. And we suspect that those hypernovas are coming from a slightly different uh, type of core collapse supernovae. So before the shock is ever stalling, you can have some stars with a very, very, very strong magnetic field. And while your star is collapsing on itself, the magnetic field is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And if your star rotates on itself, the magnetic field will automatically tend to form some jets. And this is actually those jets that will explode the supernova. And why are they so bright? Simply because of the fact that first, you have a lot of energy available because you have a lot of rotation, you have a lot of magnetic fields. And second, because they happen in a so short time that you don't lose energy in trying to revive the shock. You directly expel everything. And everything is expelled quite easily due to the magnetic field, which can also take some rotation from the proton and transfer and directly convey it into the matter. So this is all kinds of hypernovae. Uh, can we observe a failed supernova that just turns into a black hole? If the failed supernova happens a bit later, like if it doesn't turn immediately into a black hole, you can potentially see it. 
thing is also if you wait a bit, so there is too much matter that falls onto the proton transfer and turns into a black hole, it might happen that the shock is still outgoing. So you will end up with a supernova, but the remnant is a black hole, a tiny one, like a black hole. So you will see a very faint emission because of course you will not have as much energy as you have in a classical core collapse, but you will observe it. And another way of observing faint supernovae is, oh, faint, failed supernovae, is actually when the black hole is forming, if your star is rotating in the beginning, you can have some matter that will turn into an accretion disk. And then if it's close enough, you should be able to observe it. Mm -hmm. What types of supernovas exist and what will each of them result in? Types of supernovas, so um, we have already two different families. So thermonuclear supernovae, okay, three families. So thermonuclear supernovae, so the explosion of a white dwarf I was talking about before. So a white dwarf can only have a mass that cannot be superior to 1.4 small masses, which is called the Chandrasekhar mass. After that, they will collapse on themselves. Or, more interesting, while they accrete matter, they will begin to collapse. So, of course, the temperature increases in the middle. And you will enter a phase where you will begin to have fusion into a degenerate medium. What happens if you begin fusion into a degenerate medium? Your medium cannot expand, which is usually happening when a medium gets hotter. So, it cannot expand. So it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and you get what we call a runaway explosion. So this is supernovae type 1a. It's actually the explosion of a white dwarf. You will have nothing at the end, but they look good. And they always happen in the same way, which is especially nice because we can use them to measure distances and to measure how the universe is expanding, for example, because it's very easy to shift them back. Uh, together. Another type of supernovae, so the parent stability supernovae, as I talked in the very beginning about, is when you have a mass, a star that is hypermassive. Then in the core, very similar thing um, to the thermonuclear explosion will happen, but only in the core, and it will end up disrupting the whole star. Thing is that you need a solar core, a helium core, actually with a mass superior to 60 solar masses. So those stars are usually around 100 solar masses. We don't find them that often, trust me, and it was mainly happening in the early stages uh, of the universe. So we don't find them that often. And in the core collapse, there are the three, three kinds. So the mhg driven supernovae, the ones with the high magnetic fields that will produce hypernovas. The neutrinal driven core collapse, so the ones I mainly talked about, and the failed core collapse, which my director doesn't appreciate we call them failed, but see, it's technically what's here. Uh, could you explain some more about the discovery of gravitational waves? It's, I can try. Um, so as far as I remember, I mean, so first you need to go back to Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, Okay, the next speaker is making a sign that he will talk about that, actually, a bit. But so we had this theory, we knew that theoretically they were existing, but they are so hard to see that we hadn't detect them, detected them before. In 2015, Le, uh, Lego and Virgo detected the first real signal of something, uh, which they assumed would be a supermassive black hole major which is one of the things that will create the most, the strongest gravitational waves. And after a few months of proof checking everything, because it was an extremely important step into physics and astrophysics in general, in, after a few months of fact checking, they did publish their results and they did a conference about it, which was quite important, more or less everywhere. Uh, except Betelgeuse. What good candidates do you hope for to actually explode in our lifetime? Mm, there is a few other candidates, but I think they all have phone number names. Um, the only one I know with its name is Betelgeuse. 
after I don't think we mapped exactly all the stars in our galaxy. So fortunately, one of them will explode. Because Betelgeuse, it could be tomorrow, it could be in 5,000 years or even later. So in our lifetime, there will probably be something at some point or another, at least I hope. Because I was not even born for the next one. So I really hope there will be one <laughs> before I finish to see them. Thank you. No problem.